Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Julia Strelo. I work at the Illinois State Board of Education, um, and I am here to talk to you about our study of learning social emotional well-being program study, um, which is a partnership with AIR. And um, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I've been at the State Board of Education in Illinois for two years, and before that, I worked for about 15 years at different nonprofits in the city of Chicago in childhood trauma. So that's my background. And my colleague presenting with me today is um, not Annie. She unfortunately couldn't make it to um, Washington, D.C., Virginia today. But um, Kim, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then I'll keep going. Thanks, Julia. And it's a pleasure to be presenting with you, uh, representing a research practice partnership. Um, uh, Annie is the research end of the ISB team, and I'm the um, lead, uh, the American Institutes for Research lead on the study. So happy to be working with you. So our study is a three-year research practice partnership study um, that looks at three programs that are the uh, primary SEL-based investments that ISBE, the State Board of Education, has. Um, one is called the Social Emotional Learning Hubs. Those are seven entities across the state of Illinois that are based in our regional offices of education and one in Chicago Public Schools that received money to offer professional learning around social emotional learning topics for educators. They have reached over 100,000 people in their activities in the last two and a half years. So they've kept quite busy. They also partner with the REACH program, Resilience Education to Advance Community Healing, which is a program run by the Center for Childhood Resilience at the Children's Hospital in Chicago that is about um, uh, educators and teams at schools doing a needs assessment, the trauma responsive schools needs assessment, and then building an action plan and trying to really enhance the knowledge that their school has about trauma and how to respond to trauma in students. And then the third program is our Community Partnerships Grants Program, which is a expanded learning time and social emotional and student wellness focused grant program that um, we have 136 entities who receive that funding. So I'm gonna let Kim talk a little bit about the study components and then I'll come back. So very quickly, um, this study is a study in three parts. We are doing an implementation study, which uh, we are interviewing people from across the state who are engaged in this work um, to learn about how it's going, uh, what are the facilitators and barriers of, of doing this work. Uh, we're looking at outcomes. We've launched um, the first statewide survey of uh, student social emotional learning and educator well-being. Um, we, did data collection last spring. We are the surveys are open right now for this year. I'm very excited about that. And there's also a cost study where we'll learn about um, how all of this, uh, what it all costs, and how to pay for it. I think you're up for the next one too. Ah, so okay. these are some of our yeah. findings. Yes. So um, what did we learn from the surveys last year? Um, and Jing Tung Pan is here, a member of our team who led this work. Um, so. Uh, this is from the staff survey um, of professional well-being. We measured a lot of things. Um, basically, staff are telling us that they their schools are paying attention to well-being. They're paying attention to uh, student functioning, um, and they're feeling supported in doing that work. However, um, it, one of these things is not like the others. If you look at the bottom. Professional well-being, which is basically burnout, it's a nice way of saying burnout, um, really not in a good place right now. And if you move to the student, um, students are doing okay. Um, the areas of relative strength um, in terms of their social-emotional competencies, um, social awareness, they know what's going on around them. They're struggling with their own self-management. Um, they're... they're um, Goal setting, getting their schoolwork done, these things are, are hard for them right now. So that's what we've seen so far. Just a little bit more about the results of our implementation study, which was the, the interviews throughout the state that were done, um, that we did hear that schools and districts are saying they continue to need new and innovative ways to respond to some of these issues in this post-pandemic or, or ongoing pandemic 
era that we're in um, that they would like to help staff better understand these concepts, especially trauma and social emotional learning, and that kind of in response to that data point that Kim shared, that they they really know that they need to continue to be able to promote educator well-being. Um, they also, from the interviews, we learned um, about a number of activities that schools are doing that have helped them. So um, we heard staff and um, and regional leaders talk about um, destigmatizing mental health and some of these issues, um, having a common language that they've been able to establish, especially through the REACH initiative, which has provided really some universal training to anybody that participates. And then some of these domains that are on the assessment, I think, have been universally really used by folks. Um, and uh, this is a quote from a coach in one of our regional social emotional learning hubs. So it's a person who's really in the school every day. And I, I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize it. Um, this person is saying that this isn't even a philosophical belief. It's a right there in your face belief for both administrators and mental health professionals in schools. They want help. They know they need the help because they think their jobs have just been inundated with helping teachers navigate the social emotional ne needs, not in, only in the classrooms, but of themselves and of the parents of the students. It's moved from what felt right to just really having the confidence and knowing that this is right. It's something that we really have to address. Um, so um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but this is my last slide. So I'm, <laughs> I'm curious if I have a little bit of time to not rush here. So what are we doing? Um, right now to respond to what we learned in the first year of the study. Right now we are navigating the sustainability questions of these programs. So um, we are not quite sure at this moment in time what will happen um, after September with the REACH and the SEL Hubs programs, but there's certainly a lot of conversations and work going on in Illinois about what happens with those two programs. Um, the study is in its second year and ongoing, and um, Kim was saying she's really excited to hear about this kind of second iteration of the survey to be able to compare that data to last year and hopefully get even more responses. And then we have a third year of the study, so um, we'll have a lot more to share once we have been able to get through those two periods of time. But in the interim, ISBE has responded to a number of the things that we've learned in this study by integrating them into our strategic plan for the next three years. Um, and that includes really compiling a lot of the resources that we already have into a resilience toolkit that will be used by both students and staff that has yet to be clearly defined because we have a lot of engagement with stakeholders to do about building it. Um, we do plan to, despite the sustainability questions, continue to partner with those regional offices and hubs um, and the people who have been involved in that work for so long to provide a lot of the professional learning resources that we know that staff are asking about. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we will update our social emotional learning standards, our learning standards for students in Illinois, and hopefully integrate an adult component. Illinois was the first state in the entire country to have social emotional learning standards in 2005, but we haven't updated them since then. <laughs> so we, um, they're very, uh, they're not, they're not modernized, and we, um, in fact, had several high school students at our board meeting two weeks ago tell us that they will be involved in updating the standards with, with us, which is great. We're so excited that they wanted to do that, and they had a laundry list of things that they expected us to incorporate into the new standards when we when we make them. So I'm excited. I will lead that project at ISBE, and it'll be very much informed by the work that we've learned in this project. So. I hope that's okay on time, but that's what we got. Thank you. Great. I think this is my chair, yeah. Thank you. I think so, that's still on. You could also use that if you don't I, understand. Yes, this is the clicker. It is the clicker, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so. Uh, this represents one of the network's core research teams and the work that they've been doing. And then to kind of ground this work, Patricia Bellana, who's the managing director at the Grad Partnership, will um, provide some further details on the research that they've been doing there. Thank you, Susan. And hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, Bob Alphonse was meant to be here. He sends greetings and apologies. Um, so you definitely go around. A bad deal. It's just me today. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> I look nothing like him. <laughs> 
All right, um, school connectedness. Um, I guess what I have to say about school connectedness would not be new to anyone um, in this room. Um, students are connected to school. When students are connected to school, they do better in coursework, they come to school, um, they have fewer riskier behaviors, they graduate high school, and they tend to, um, to get to college. Um, at a greater rate than their disconnected um, peers. Um, like many things in life, we don't know the value of things until it's not there. Um, takes so much for granted. I think that was the issue with, um, with connectedness, student connectedness. We didn't feel it missing until we didn't have it. And obviously the impacts um, are enormous. So I think we would all agree um, that when students are, are connected to school, um, better mental, better physical health, engage in those fewer riskier behaviours and um, it, school connectedness really is um, an effective universal um, prevention action. It's a key part of student success systems. I'm going to say a little bit more about student success systems in a few moments um, but that is really the work of the Grant Partnership implementing and scaling student success systems across the nation. Okay, so um, students feel connected to school when four things are true. Again, this is not going to be new to folks in the room. Um, when student Number one, when students know there is an adult who knows them and cares about them. Secondly, when they're part of a supportive peer group. Thirdly, uh, when they can engage in learning opportunities and pro-social activities and really helping others. And finally, when they're accepted in school for who they are. Um, nothing <coughs> earth shattering there, but those are the four key pieces um, of school connectedness. So what does the research say? I believe we have some, some colleagues and some friends in the room today from the Chicago Consortium. As I look at that, I think this research was actually April 23, so that may be a typo. My apologies if I've got that wrong. But they've done some really great work in um, investing in adolescents that speaks um, to this um, body of research on school and student connectedness. As, is, as has CDC, um, they've done some really good work um, with students who, indicating that students who feel close to people um, at school are less likely to feel um, persistently sad or hopeless. And we were just talking at our, our table and Paolo was sharing just his worries around mental health, uh, particularly in girls, you know, so we're, um, we're thinking much about that. So student success systems, I'll let you take 20 seconds just to read the first bullet in terms of what student success systems are or how we're thinking about them, how we're defining them. And really there's four key components to student success systems. Number one, strong relationships. Um, secondly, real-time actionable data. Thirdly, strategic improvement actions. And then fourthly, and importantly, student-centered mindsets. So that's how we at the Grant Partnership um, are thinking about um, student success systems. Please check out our website, um, grantpartnership.org. Uh, we're about two, two and a half years into a 10 year plus effort. Um, there's a couple of pieces um, just to draw your attention to today. Um, many student success systems, the EWIMS project, uh, or the EWIMS model, um, AIR, the ninth grade on track, the BAR model, just to name but a few. Um, all evidence-based and have shown really positive results. And one of our colleagues at JHU has done a really nice two-pager um, just on those student um, success systems. And then at the Grad Partnership, uh, we are off to a little bit of a flying start. We're careful how we talk about it. Uh, we want to be really happy about it and shout from the rooftops, but we're very conscious um, that it was the most difficult year for schools and educators and students. Um, but off to a strong start for those implementing um, schools. Um, three things we have found, I haven't had a chance to put the third piece um, on, the, on the slide, but in terms of course failures, 
Um, the percentage of students failing courses um, declined by about 5%, which is wonderful for our implementing schools. Chronic absenteeism um, also declined by an average of 5.4 percentage points during the first year. We hear every day about the issues on chronic absenteeism. Again, our table was talking about it just um, at the introduction. So for our implementing schools, we're really happy to report um, the reduction in chronic absenteeism. And then the third piece, so much of this depends on the student success teams at the school. Uh, for those implementing schools in the study, they, um, they find that student success teams were actually established and retained um, and, and made some good progress. Um, so lots to be proud of, but lots of, lots of hard work to do. I think there's maybe just one more slide. So the Grad Partnership um, is a coalition of nine organizations. Um, very grateful to have American Institutes for Research as one of our core and leading partners. We have three or four other technical assistance um, providers um, in the coalition. Also, we have two or three advocacy organizations, um, rural schools, obviously, obviously representing our rural communities. The Shaw Foundation, and I believe we have some folks from the OTL networks in the room today, and then the National Centre for Learning Disabilities. So at the moment, we're a coalition of nine organisations working collectively and collaboratively to implement student success systems across the country. There's more work to be done than nine organisations could do together. So we're always looking for communicating partners to help disseminate, spread the word, we're looking for intermediaries that can partner with us um, to help just implement student success systems. So if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more, um, please find me before I disappear today. How am I doing for time, Kylie? Ah, I made it. Eight minutes. <laughs> Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much to the research teams um, for presenting. Um, what we're going to turn to now are our panelists. So we have um, two superintendents and a school principal who are um, going to kind of react to what they've heard. And I can kind of set the frame it for you. Um, and we can go from. Um, from you. Do you mind starting? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so the um, the the big question is. You know, based on what you just heard, what is it that resonated with you and what surprised you based on your own experience? All right. Okay, you can oh, do either one. Which okay, one I'll do, do this one. Yep. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I really am so excited to be here. I want to thank Kylie for inviting me and thank you for AIR for hosting this. Um, my name is Liz Kirby. I'm the superintendent of the Cleveland Heights University High School District. Um, if you know the Kelsey brothers, they went to that district. They talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, even on their podcast, they tell all the stories. Um, and uh, I've been there for five years. Um, and uh, God, I have a lot to say. Actually, the School Pulse panel that you referenced in the opening, I used during a work session last year because we were having so many climate issues, especially in our middle schools. And so I wanted to kind of frame the understanding because people, you know, at a local level, people don't necessarily understand that a challenge is a challenge nationwide. So actually that was so helpful for me as a leader to share with um, parents, teachers, principals, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot that resonates with me and what was presented. I really thank you all for that. Um, I can tell you that um, I found post-pandemic uh, two things, there are two dynamics at play. For sure, um, teachers are very tired. And so that the slide that shows that the less than two thirds feel energized is our daily reality. We recently surveyed our staff this year and shared those results and it, and it just rung true that we have to find a way to really help our educators heal because they have so many um, things that have been placed on their placed on their laps to address. You know, during the pandemic, schools did everything. Um, it was the one of the few institutions that was functioning and um, it tired everyone and people are still reeling from that. Um, 
connected to that, the piece about the students and the self-management connects directly to chronic absenteeism. We still see that, especially at high school, um, students don't feel like they have to come to school every day or in every period. And honestly, that may or may not be true. Maybe education is changing. So maybe we'll be pushed some, to a different, a different place. Um, but it does impact that, that sense of connectedness, um, for sure. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, and, I'll just, and I'll just say this just to end my comments to start, um, this notion of the student is really interesting because when the pandemic hit, I remember the head of our union saying, we need to just spend all of our time on social emotional learning. And I was like, no, because the kids, they miss two years, and they can't read, and we have to. So he's like, no, nope, we should. And I didn't listen. And he was correct because the, the amount of, of social emotional learning that kids lost being in front of screen for a year, year and a half, however long that was, had such a huge impact in schools from the smallest learners to the oldest learners. And we didn't take time to address that, to have a strategy around that. Quite frankly, we didn't know what to do, at least we didn't in our district. Like, we didn't know what to do. Like, there wasn't a lot of research around, around that. Um, and there was such a press of academics, 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 academics. Um, and so I think, you know, we just find ourselves not really thinking about what does student connectedness look like how do you cultivate that while working with a staff that is also very tired? So. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is David Lyon. I'm a superintendent from Minnetonka, Minnesota, just west of Minneapolis. And it's exciting to be here and have this conversation. And so many things Elizabeth said are, are resonating. It's hard to go back to the panelists because that was a long time ago, or the presenters. Um, I. One of the things that I thought was true 15 years ago is people would say, don't build a brick and mortar school anymore because everyone's gonna wanna learn online. And I, at that time I laughed and I said, have you ever called a snow day? Because that one day when people don't come to school, people are really unhappy about it. And we got to the pandemic and sent them home for a long time. Um, some of the things that I think are colliding at the same time, and this is hypothesis, is that as less and less Human interaction happens outside the walls of school. The role we play in teaching humans how to interact with each other becomes more and more important. And that was probably spiking pre-pandemic. And then the pandemic created this gap. And our educators who were getting you know, pretty good at helping people get to school and get in line in the right spot and go to the right spot and recess. So we have this gap at a time where we really, it was probably critical to teach students how to, how to hang around with other human beings. Then we come back from the pandemic where our educators are tired, and now we have students that are one, two, three years behind in those age-appropriate skills. The teachers still out there, I teach ninth grade, this is what ninth graders need to learn, <laughs> and kids are coming with their sixth grade skills because they didn't get that for three years. So fewer of our teachers are working harder than ever, not to catch up, but just to slowly close that gap of how to interact with other humans. And I, I think um, we in education use the science of, you know, what does research show us works? And SEL, I think, is intended probably early on for us to start teaching the skills that kids weren't getting playing with their neighborhood peer groups or in those all those social interactions. And, and it came to schools because, like you said, we can do it. You know, feed your children, hand out technology, educate. We were the part of the society that held together when everything else was pausing. And, and so I think one of the things that resonated with me um, about belonging, and, and you know, we're here because we can speak on both of those things, but my district has been measuring belonging. And I, you know, I think our students who haven't been in social settings and don't have those skills have less of a sense of belonging be, because their friends don't know how to show it. And I mean, they have lots of ways through technology to show other things, but the human interaction and belonging, we're bringing that into our schools. And so the measurable part of belonging really resonated with me and some of the work that we're doing and how that connected. And then, you know, we, we had the question about what, what are you concerned about? And I'm very defensive of public education 
shouldering everything that society says we can't seem to figure out because we have a limited capacity and resource and we have to prioritize what's most important for us to be doing. So I'll stop there. Wow. I have to follow two superintendents. This is a little old principal from Long Island, New York. She's amazing. I've already oh, talked to her. You She's got, got the real it. story. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the things that resonated with me the most were absolutely the connectedness. When I first became a principal at West Middle School in Brentwood, Long Island, um, we had a group of students called SIFE students. Those are students with interrupted formal education, which means that they came to us with two years or more of a gap in their educational process. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of what Brentwood is like, Brentwood is a socioeconomically disadvantaged area. It is the largest suburban school district in New York State. We have several students who are either undocumented or unaccompanied youth. A lot of our parents are working around the clock and our children are left to care for younger siblings. And yet, let me share with you that I wouldn't want to be anywhere else because the passion and the commitment of the community is live. When I first got to West Middle School and I had this SIFE population, it was almost as if they were an entity within the school. And it really bothered me that they didn't seem to be a part of the school community. They didn't have a connection. Add to the mix that at that point, MS-13 was very popular both in El Salvador, which is our largest popularity, uh, population of immigrant students, and also the consulate for El Salvador is in Brentwood, New York. So what does that look like for a student who comes to Brentwood, New York with a bunch of other students who've already, already lived in an area where they were um, led to believe that they had to pay for their safety, where um, they were unsafe? And some of the students that came to Brentwood came there because the, the family who, are, who was in, the parent who was in Brentwood could no longer afford to send the payment for their child to stay in El Salvador, it was almost like a rent, if you will, otherwise their parents would be harmed. So those children who really didn't know their parents had to leave grandma and the safety of their home to come and live with these strangers in Brentwood, Long Island. And so I'm going to ask you right now to just take a minute. You have been arrested. You're embarrassed. But somebody needs to come and bail you out or put you in the right direction. Who are you going to call? I want you to think of that person that comes to your mind first. Who is that person that you know you can count on? Does everybody have that person in their head? Raise your hand if you have a person that you know you can call. Raise it up high. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, thank you. Put your hands down. Now, one person did not raise their hand, but imagine as a child coming to a country to live with a stranger who they're telling you is your parent that you don't know in an area where you can't really speak the language. You don't have a person. If something happens to you, what are you supposed to call this stranger? <coughs> you have no connection where you are. You have no person. So connectedness is absolutely at the forefront of success anywhere. Mm. It became my goal at my school to make sure that those SIFE school students, all students, obviously, but that we, we paid close attention to those students who were being victimized by individuals who knew how they could be taken advantage of, who didn't speak the language, who maybe didn't have a person, and they became my goal. And I was able to partner with some outside communities that helped parents to feel more comfortable coming to school, that let children know what their rights were, who gave them a sense of connectedness. And because of those, Plaza Comunitaria, Strong Youth, a lot of the organizations that we have embedded in our school culture have allowed our SIFE students not to be a separate entity, but a part of the West Middle culture. And I said to you earlier, David, um, that I'm from West, where we do everything with every step together. We started with that mantra in the beginning, and we have continued to do that work now. So what, resonate, what resonated with me was that connection that is so important for everyone to have, right? You need a person, you need a place to go, you feel safe, and you touch on those four points that were, were talked about earlier. I hope I'm not talking too much. <laughs> um, and, and so the impact of student connectedness for all of our students, girls who are empowered, and I forgot to tell you that sex trafficking is really big. It's not what you probably think it looks like, but mm -hmm. obviously unaccompanied minors who really don't have checks and balances are easily targeted. Mm -hmm. 
it's so important to be able to have someone to talk to and to implement programs where connectedness is at the start. Fast forward to the pandemic, of course. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I thought was super interesting was that well, the well-being eight domains, the top ones were social awareness and responsible decision making. Because I know that in my school as a principal, one of the banes of my existence is Snapchat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna hurry. And social media. And when they were home, their connection to the outside world was through a screen, right? And I call them laptop warriors because they could suit, say and do anything they wanted to from behind a screen. But when we had to get back into society, we had to face people and we had to develop social nuances that maybe a third grader who's now a sixth grader might not have had the time to mature with. It was a big deal. So that social awareness and responsible decision making at 86 and 81% for those survey results for self-management to me was very eye-opening because on one hand, obviously, they're not doing such a great job because they're really not mature enough to deal with social media. But on the other hand, they are very social aware because ask them to make a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> right off the top. Okay, I saw my time is up, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so um, I feel like we heard lots of great perspectives here and some um, the researchers share their research. This is for the whole panel and then we will, I, I promise, turn it over to folks to ask some questions as well. Um, I'm curious about, um, based on your experience and or the research that you've been doing, have you seen, and it, some of you have already kind of foreshadowed this, have you seen differences in terms of um, student groups and connectedness um, things like grade levels, um, particular student needs, that sort of thing. Anyone can start. I would say, uh, whew, middle school. <laughs> I didn't know. Middle school, in my estimation, in ninth grade, um, had the most challenging um, experience post pandemic, just if we just look at, at my district. Um, and to your point, students in sixth grade really were coming with like third and fourth grade skills. Um, and in my area, you know, middle schools are together in Chicago, it's K to eight. Boy, do I wish we had K to eight schools. Um, so you have an interesting mix of kids coming in coming into a space, trying to figure out lockers, moving around, just not, um, like they really, with the social media, you know, they really, 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 and continue to struggle with that. So I found that. I also found that, um, uh, well, it, it depends on the year. So the first year it was the black boys in my district um, we had lots of challenges um, as they were transitioning, actually middle school through high school. Um, and then the next year it was um, girls with disabilities, so it kind of depended. But tip just generally, if you were marginalized before the pandemic, you were really marginalized after the pandemic. Um, that's what we found. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I don't have the specific statistics, but I can tell you that for students, the students who did not endorse either male or female gender, but something else, by far had the highest level of need mm. in terms of everything we measured, pretty much. Mm. Um, they, they were um, disconnected for sure, but uh, just in terms of their self-management, their um, capacity to, um, to, to endorse those social emotional competencies that all students need was so I would highlight them as a group. So um, in Minnesota, we have a research organization called the Search Institute, and they do developmental relationships. And I, I've only been in my current district two years, but they started using the developmental relationship survey with students in elementary school, middle school, and high school uh, on an annual basis to measure year over year progress. Are we building that sense of belonging? And um, it, it, like any good school initiative, they had given the survey and the leaders got the data and I walked into the room in my June meeting with them and they were looking like, okay, how long are we doing this, right? 
Mm. How long should I analyze this data because are we going to do something different next year? And um, it took another six months and another round of surveys and me saying, all right, we're going to move the needle on these data points because it measured demographic uh, breakdowns across school settings uh, in our district and certainly uh, students that were non-binary that didn't identify as male or female and we we're just reported to our board last Thursday trend data over three years and now you know we, we've started to go from principals being reluctant to now they're um, moving into embedding this and they're working with their staff on it and it's worked into the teacher level and there are specific things that this tool uses on what teachers can do to develop belonging. And they measure trusted adults and they measure does this, is it a warm and caring environment? Are they challenging my growth? All those things. And um, we're at the spot, we've seen some year over year improvement in all areas. One of the fascinating things is every teacher gets to measure, do I do this well? And then they merit to students is my teacher doing it well? And it's a, probably a lot like us going to the dentist. I floss all the time, and then the dentist says, well, your teeth don't say that, right? <laughs> um, there's a, a pretty wide gap between teacher perspective of, am I creating a welcoming environment for all my students and different students? The, you know, one of our barriers is in order to get good student data, it's anonymous. And so we get this data, and we have this pocket of 300 students across our district that show they're disconnected and non-binary, but we don't know who they are. And so the, um, that's, that's good in the sense that they're trusting and it's anonymous. It's challenging because there isn't a, a tool set to give our ad adults to say, let's connect with this group of students. Mm -hmm. But um, that belonging piece and, and some year-over-year -year data, for, for me, the way to get our staff to buy in is for them to, to be able to see that. It's still an annual um, report and it's we give it in December and the hard part is the teachers aren't quite sure what thing am I doing that's making a difference but this last spring our high school took the areas where we wanted to show growth and had students that were cross demographic representative to say this is what it feels like to be supported and challenged and welcomed by staff members and then staff, they recorded it so students didn't report to all the staff members and they played it at a staff meeting for half an hour to say, hey, this is what you can do to make it make me feel like I'm part of your class. I feel like that's got a fighting chance to make a difference. Um, so that's one of the steps we're taking on belonging and it, I, I feel like at least we will have a couple years of data to show that we're intentional. And e even when we tell students hey, the fact that you belong here matters to us, I think opens up the minds of some students who are thinking they don't want me here. And so when someone sits down and says, hey, I want you here. So. You want me to say something? Sure. Time. Okay, very quickly, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's one of the things that we were able to do was to start an enrichment academy. And what that enrichment academy does is it allows students to connect with the teacher with a common passion. So teachers are now having the opportunity to engage with students um, with things like Zumba, Guitar Club, Walk and Talk, Book Chats. Um, we had one group of students, all male, who decided to knit. I truly believe it oh. was the knitting needles that attracted them. <laughs> but, we did, but we did collect them at the end of every one of those. <laughs> and they really loved doing it. To that end, we know that statistics do show that teachers, when they connect with students outside of the classroom, mm -hmm. create a bond and students tend to perform better. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing I'm just going to brag about that with connectedness and say we have done a lot of things to try to promote connectedness and will continue to do so. And it is absolutely imperative that students connect with teachers. Okay, thank you. So we've, so we've asked you, you, you've shared many really great ideas for what you've seen work. I'm just curious what you see as your biggest barriers to student connectedness. And this is for the whole group. Okay, you're looking at me, so no, I'm... No, I mean, I, I just can't help I'm, I'm you, but say, no, I, you can start. Yeah. I will say that the biggest barrier, um, and this is absolutely with no disrespect to teachers because I respect them tremendously, but one of the biggest barriers to student connectedness or student progress, if you will, has just been that social emotional piece and teachers not necessarily being trained on how to mm -hmm. deal with. So I am happy to see that there are a lot of initiatives that are taking place that will help teachers, A, to be more empathetic because um, 
in the community where I am, the teachers don't, many of the teachers don't look like the students or can't relate to those experiences like not having a person. And being post-pandemic, when we're getting teachers in middle school, I'll say, mm -hmm. who are taught, for example, to teach children how to unpack text, but the teachers in elementary teach them how to read and write, how to learn how to decipher and read text. And when you get them in middle school and they can't do this part, they certainly can't unpack it. But the teachers here haven't been taught how to teach them how to read. And it's the best connection that I can, it's the best kind of way that I can tell you about that alignment or that that's where the challenge lies is that teachers have been inheriting students that don't have basic skills or are not mature enough. They're inheriting students that they haven't been trained on how to teach or how to address them socially. And that has been a huge challenge, just getting them to kind of meet where they are and understand. Others? Yeah. There's a question there is for student connectedness. Yeah. Yeah, I probably, you know, a lot of districts are starting to talk about this, but um, screen time on cell phones, I think, has been extremely detrimental for kids and I this is from someone who you know I'm a I believe in freedom kids doing you know managing it but I will tell you that um, and I think it, it is you know kind of a, a result of the pandemic and like kids being on technology because they had to and now they're kind of there really is addiction it really is difficult it really does impact development um, I see kids in our middle school and high school who do not talk to each other, because I think the student to student connectedness is important, but they are on, you know, the phones constantly. Not that there isn't like, you know, reasons and needs for that too. I think we want to help kids be responsible with that. Um, but it does create a barrier. It can create, in some instances, you know, like when you make a mistake as a kid, now it's forever and shared hundreds of times. Thank God I didn't grow up, let me just tell you. <laughs> um, and I, I do think that. So, you know, you, you'll see governors, I know someone's here from the National Government, so you'll see governors talking about, you know, how to, you know, they're going after the media companies. Hallelujah, they should. Um, but secondly, really pushing districts to think about how do you kind of get the phones out of schools. I actually, you know, we have our first set of meetings at our middle schools coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about that for next year because, you know, it is out of control, you know, and it means that, you know, a kid, if they have a fight in school and all the phones come out, like they can never heal. And it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's horrible for the climate. It's horrible for kids individually, too. So I think that's a big barrier. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, just very, um, very briefly. So last week, um, the Grad Partnership team convened about 80 school districts in Denver, Colorado. Um, and we heard lots of what my colleagues on the panel were saying. Um, teachers are tired. Our pay is terrible. Um, but one thing that we heard over and over again was that students are showing up with mental health issues that are reflective of the families and the communities that they come from. And they were appealing for help in sort of family engagement and um, some resources and strategies around that, but they saw it as a big barrier to um, true connectedness again and getting back to where we were. I, I'd throw in um, probably two things. One, uh, societal perceptions about what we should and should be teaching, like how you should interact socially really scares some adults, maybe some adults who don't have great social interactions, but the concept of SEL and um, should we be teaching those skills, that parent piece, we have to be really parent involved as we talk about the role we're doing for connectedness and, and uh, for everything we do. I, I sort of relate it to, for those of you who are into fitness, you can't just go to the gym once a year and say, you know, that's my fitness habit. Um, because likely you're not going to remember what you did the last time and you're not going to develop any productive habits. For our efforts with connectedness, this is going to be part of who we are forever while the outside of school has got less connected, whether it's not safe or whether it's technology driven. And so I, I, a lot of times people look at public education and say, hey, do, do this really hard for a year or two, like the ESSER funds. Here's two years to do this <laughs> and then, you know, it'll be fixed. 
Um, I think it's a commitment to us. One of the barriers is to explain to people, this is now what uh, public education will be doing, our teachers will be doing, it'll have to be embedded in our systems long standing because if if we are gonna be developing these skills for these students, we'll, we should plan on it being part of our program. And, and certainly if we're measuring connectedness. And I think the impatience in the community is always one, what are you doing behind our backs? And two, uh, when are you going to be done with it? And I don't know that we'll, we'll ever be done with um, teaching our students about how to work with each other productively. Thank you. So um, one more just question for the whole group, and then we'll turn it over to folks to ask other questions. Um, some of you have sort of alluded to this. Who else needs to be collaborating or at the table for you to solve this challenge or do this work? I'll just say that um, two of our programs that we've studied are really the SEL hub group and then the REACH group are just the totally school focused regional leaders is the SEL hubs and then the REACH program is all mental health clinicians and it's been a very interesting journey to get them to collaborate and you know Illinois is a very diverse state so uh, people in Southern Illinois have a lot of thoughts about what Chicago tells them to do and that has really like shown up in this work but also we have found that the two groups um, can't, can't be successful without the other one. You can't implement the REACH initiative without people who are from that community asking their schools to do this program and you can't do a program about trauma responsiveness in schools without expertise in trauma responsiveness, which is what, not what educators have. So um, I think we, I don't really know if I'm actually answering your question, but I think that, you know, from that mental health perspective, there is an expertise and in, in a, a particularity there that we don't maybe want to put that responsibility on our school community. So we need those people to show up, but we also really have to take the time to build relationships and to work on it because it's not it's not always smooth sailing, so it's definitely been a, a big piece of it and an ongoing part of what I work on to try to get them, get them all to, to work together. Mm -hmm. so, oh, go sorry. ahead. No, go ahead. I'd be really remiss if I didn't say that policymakers, um, didn't, they need to be at the table. Policymakers need to understand why we need to have that sustainability that you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, this year in particular, we just came back um, from lobbying on the Hill um, because at some point they wanted to take away Title I funding by 80%. They wanted to cut the funding. And um, I, I, we went to the Hill, we spoke with policymakers, and we got to tell them from a boots on the ground perspective, like that enrichment program that I mentioned to you, helped with chronic absenteeism, it helped kids want to come to school, they started to perform better, their academic prowess was improved. All of these things occurred, and I'm just scratching the surface on what my district in particular would have lost from a program that they cut 80% that had been in existence since 1965, although it has changed, it's, it's extremely important for a policymaker to be at the tables so that they can understand why the legislation that they're proposing impacts education and children and our future. Go ahead. Um, I always kids at the table, always students at the table. Um, uh, as I, there's some research I was reading about, you know, the impact of student voice on climate as well, where kids feel like they really play a role in cr creating, crafting, and sustaining. It helps improve climate. I can't remember where, where it was from, but just recently saw that. Um, I also, you know, I know we're at AIR. I also think we need the researchers at the table. I think that at every level, the classroom level, the school level, and the district level, people are trying to figure it out. My email, and I'm sure yours, are flooded with here's an SEL toolkit. Here's a come to this. Like there's so, everybody selling everything, and I mean I even like did this. Somebody said something about preventing. I bought this like six hundred dollars. It was crazy. I don't know why I did it, but I was trying to figure out. It was like you know my schools were on fire, so I was trying to figure out how do we address climate. Um, so I, I just think that is so important to continue to do this research because people are trying to and get it out as well. Um, is really key. There's, and then the network piece is so very powerful. 
if you're not in a Chicago or a New York or 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 in LA or you finding those networks that are research based is difficult. And there are people who want to do that, but it's just I just under I underestimated um, just the capacity there. So like kind of having that and creating that um, things like the grad partnership help to for those smaller districts or entities or foundations who are trying to do good work to connect with other people. So you need the conveners, the researchers, and the kids. I just throw one other piece. You know, we talk about policymakers. Um, with a huge push to get mental health supports into schools. And we didn't talk about it, I'll just give a plug. We use a tool called Sabres and MySabres, S-A-E-B-R-S. -E and that's a screener for students. It's a, a once a year screener on their own mental health. Our secondary kids take it themselves, our fourth and fifth graders, the staff do it, and then we relay those to counselors and social workers to align, this is a student I'm aware of that might have some concerns, or this is a student that wasn't on my radar. I should check in to see how we do that. We have some longitudinal data that we put in our data warehouse. It's just another point to say, who is this whole well-rounded student? Um, but one of the, you know, the gap, I think, in terms of well-being is we, we're open from seven to three. And we're not therapeutic. And so I always would have our policymakers and our community providers say, you're going to be the bridge. We can identify who's in crisis, but then there's a handoff, right? And so I just informed policymakers and informed community providers about here's the role that we plan to play in this problem. You know, ensure kids are healthy, and we need you to, to do the therapeutic part of that. And it will take care of ensure our kids are connected. But... I, you know, I can't stress enough, if we aren't telling our parents exactly what we're doing, they're talking to each other on social media with fantastic stories about <laughs> what, what they think we're doing, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. Um, you know, clearly educators are tired. Um, they're putting students first, but they're still really tired, and um, it doesn't really necessarily contribute to a more systemic kind of approach because they're just tired. Um, the other challenge that it seems like you're highlighting are, you know, what ha was happening before was by no means perfect, um, but sometimes that's that's actually bogging us down and what we need to do now. Um, I, the expectation of students being able to unpack uh, an assign a uh, reading assignment in middle school when they don't have the skills to move forward. So there's a lot of kind of rethinking I know each of you are doing on a daily basis. We really appreciate that. Um, so I'd love to turn this over to the audience to see if there are any questions here for our panelists. And I will walk around with my microphone. So. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Leila Bonneau from the Council of Chief State School Officers. Um, I had a question around including student voice and perspective, and so Liz, I know you touched on that. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you or others on the panel can talk about specific examples of what that looks like or how that shows up to include that student perspective. Yeah, I in my district, we have a, I have a group of students I meet with monthly and then for the middle school quarterly, uh, so superintendent's cadre, and I, you know, for the high school kids, I really, whatever issue is at hand, district-wide, but also at the high school level, I present to them, we have an open forum that kind of share what's going on, um, what they need, what's working, what's not working. So I like floated the, like, the cell phone thing to them last year, and when I tell you <laughs> the response from my high school kids, I said, well, we, we can't do this in high school yet, so we'll start with middle school. Um, so so that's kind of one, one piece. Um, I, I do, though, think that we need to do more um, we do have things like student council and like those kind of pieces, um, but that's kind of changed. Um, and so I know in Chicago, they really had a big push and probably still do it on student voice committees at each school um, so that you, so kids are really organized to, you know, kind of share what's happening on the ground, elevate the needs that they have, and, you know, kind of be co-crafters of solutions as well. It's a direction that I want to I go to, but... Um, you know, first I'm starting with the, the student cadre. Like my middle school students talk a lot about like the lunch and food. And it's like, actually I think it's very important, but I wanna, I wanna 
push more into, you know, other things that I, I can see, like, in their data that are happening that I want their input on it to activate it. But you do have to also train adults to, to think that way, too, because there's a hesitance for any kind of conflict, you know, or having kids organizing and protesting and all that kind of stuff, too. Um, so it's a, a tension you have to navigate. But, yeah, one example. I have to laugh. I'm a middle school principal, 12 years. Um, I, whenever you go to talk to middle school kids, they'll be like, we should be able to chew gum and lunch is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's pretty much it. Um, no, uh, Portland Public Schools just did a uh, presentation at the National School Boards Conference on student voice, and the whole presentation was a junior in high school. Talked to all these school board members and superintendents about student voice, and um, they said something that I'm taking back to my district to implement, and what they do is they do a student summit that's planned by students, mm -hmm. and uh, they do it uh, in the year, you know, in my district, I think we'll do it in the fall to steer some of our planning, but it, you know, I think we hear student voice and, and say, what are students telling us? But part of that is how are we informing students too? And so they do an hour of, of the operational side of the district as a presentation on the front end of that so students understand here's the system. Mm -hmm. So then later on when they're asking questions, they're not asking questions that are, you know, well, that's outside the scope of our control. Then they do some breakouts on topics like, what should middle school students do with cell phones? The high school kids push that down to them, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, how big of a deal is social social media or whatever topic you want to talk about? And then the end of the day with they might do two breakout sessions, but the end of the day with superintendent, cabinet members, or, and board members, and sort of an open forum. And I, so I like that idea as a culminating event, but I'd also argue student voice is nonstop cycle of. How does this impact kids, and what might they be saying about it? So if we can bring them to our board meetings on a topic, whether or not they're board members on a topic that they're passionate about, or we have schools present every month, and we, I ask my principals, please include students in your presentation or at least a videotape of them so that we're hearing from students on those topics. And more often than not, it's much better news than the principals are sharing. Because kids are positive and like, oh yeah, we're, we like being involved with this. So I think it's two. It's, it's one, structures that are intentional on topics. And two, it's a, it's a mentality. Like always, they'll be involved. If I can add one thing. I think that um, there are lots of districts that do climate surveys. And you can, in, uh, I think student representation is huge. But you can actually broaden the base of students from whom you're hearing if you're actually looking at data from students. So I think that one of the things that these student summits can do is look at what are students saying on their climate surveys and, and get a, a, that perspective as well. And I, I just had one more piece, and I really like that. I, I think surveys are awesome. But I think too many districts don't go back to their kids and say, here's what you said. So it's a, this one-ended survey where I drop my information and it disappears into the twilight zone. And so I, you know, I would push back on all of us to share with our kids, uh -huh. here's what you said we should be working on. So you're, when you take the survey, it matters. So I love, I love that we're talking about the survey and getting student voice. We do use a um, school leadership program where we do survey parents, staff, and students. And then we triangulate the data to see where the differences are in our beliefs in our culture. And that's very telling because parents and teachers may think one similarly on certain things and kids will be way in left field, you know, from things like school safety and, I mean, that's a big one, mm -hmm. um, especially in a year where they're talking about things that have occurred on campuses and other places, but still, you know, mm -hmm. our kids um, respond to that as well as our parents and teachers. Some of the things that we've been able to do is to um, implement restorative practice I'm sure many people have heard about restorative practices, but we started an advisory to get some feedback from students. So once a month, we make the advisory 20 minutes to an hour long, depending. And all of my staff members have been changed in running restorative circles. And in some cases, we'll give them a prompt. But in many cases, students will come up with what they want to talk about. And it's a great way to kind of have your ear on the ground of what's going on in the school. And when the kids see that advisor every day, there's a certain level of comfort. So I'm happy about that. But another thing that we've implemented is called Leader in Me, which is by Franklin Covey, and we've just started that. And it starts with the seven habits of highly effective people, highly effective teens, and the teachers have really started to embrace it, and now we're passing that torch on to the kids 
to get them to take on some leadership perspectives and to stay to say more respectfully than what kind of gum they want and also you know the typical yeah. middle school things kids have been empowered to do that and certainly they need to consistently feel we need sustainability in that to feel empowered but these are the kinds of programs and connections that we've been able to make that have led to helping with social emotional needs of students giving students voice and choice empowering them to make decisions and also they know I don't know if you've ever been a part of a circle but if you don't have that circle tool when you're holding it it's your voice that everyone is listening to it's you who they're looking at and you who they want to hear from and then when you pass it along the next person gets to speak and to give their input and some kids have really come out of their shells because you know we do give you a pass if you don't want to talk you can pass it along but you can only do it a couple of times nobody really passes it anymore mm -hmm. everyone is happy just like they're ready to make that TikTok. that was <laughs> they, they are empowered. Yeah. They do want to be heard, and they have something to say. And we just have to make sure we listen. Yeah, just one thing to add to that really briefly. Um, something that we've been trying at the Grad Partnership is to have the students do the research. Our focus has been chronic absenteeism. So really just talking to their peers about why are they not coming to school? what needs to change to get them into school. So that has been really just interesting for us to watch. We're at the very early stages. We have piloted just about half a dozen, but it's something that we're going to continue to do over the next couple of years. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I absolutely love this panel, um, and so much of what you're saying is resonating with me. My name is Wendy Turner, and I'm an educator, um, author, and teacher leader in Wilmington, Delaware. So I've been a teacher for 14 years, so I've lived through everything that you're saying. I'm an elementary educator. And um, I've been listening to what you're saying about teachers being tired and burned out. I have lived that as well. I understand it. And there's a lot of thinking around SEL that it has to be either or, it has to be added to the plate, when really it should be infused or it should be an and concept. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that we're not being trained that way. Mm -hmm. And I work with method students every year I have for 14 years, and they always come in and they're like, oh, we're, we're doing classroom management right now. And those words just kind of make me go a little bit bristle. <laughs> and I wonder if we started rethinking our prep programs and classroom management as classroom culture. Yes. Do you? Any of you have an opinion on, or are the, is there anyone in the space from higher ed where we're rethinking about how we're sending teachers into classrooms where things are vastly different than they were four years ago, um, and 10 years ago, and 20 years ago? So that's my, my thinking, or my, my thought, my question for you. I, oh, go ahead, please. Are you sure? Oh, I'm so sure. Okay. Um, this is not a project that's re directly related to the research that I do with Kim, but um, in Illinois, one of the um, things that came out of the, the pandemic in our legislature, which was led by the Illinois Black Caucus, was something called the Whole Child Task Force, and they produced this report with dozens of recommendations, one of which was to charge uh, higher ed with looking at the learning standards around uh, restorative practices actually for like pre-licensed educators and trauma responsiveness so not it not directly SEL but like very connected topics so that's a task force I lead at ISB right now that's ongoing our recommendations will be released soon and will lead to change you know the kind of process of doing it that way is slow but I think that there is um, Definitely, I, I believe that that kind of existence of national standards for those space, the, the prep spaces are coming around these topics. Um, and there's many states that are leading the way much more than Illinois, but um, it's definitely something that we're starting to talk about. So great question. I was just going to say, I think it's needed. I think that some of the new curricula coming out are trying to integrate, you know, that's coming from the textbook companies, but I don't think that'll be sufficient. Um, I do think uh, in the landscape of, um, of teacher prep, important. That, that work and also the work around equity, which I think is really connected. Just, just to follow up on that question, for folks that are superintendents of the principal, are you finding you're having to train staff in this space a lot, like you focus a lot of your attention? Or? Yes. <laughs> Good. I'm sorry. 
I'll just go back to an earlier comment that there, you can't do anything once a year and think this is going to be habit developing. We're training our 25-year staff members on things that they maybe heard 10 years ago and have fallen out of practice because every year we pile another stack of books on top of, here's what else you need to know to be a good teacher. So I think it's just best practice that we need to have a cycle of reinforcement. Through, I mean, not just in August, but throughout the year of, here's some things to keep in mind that good teachers do. And even as all of us as adults mature, I can hear the same lesson a different time two years later, and, and now I'm thinking of it differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I love the idea of blending it into pre-teaching education, but I also know those brand new teachers are so overwhelmed with everything they thought, they, they need to get into practice before they can start realizing how to use some of those skills. So it's both. I think it's an exposure, but I think we need to commit to retraining our staff every year on the, the things that are currently the most important. I love that you, you talked about making sure that we're retraining staff. Um, at our table over there, we talked about AI. And in my first faculty meeting this year, I mentioned AI, and there was a big gasp in the room from both new and, and more seasoned, so won't call us old. Um, and I, I said, listen, it's not going anywhere. It's something that we need to embrace. And that response, the <gasps> when I said AI, was the exact response in 19, mm -hmm, when the calculator was introduced and people had a problem with it. Uh, AI is something that we need to embrace. And so it really is a mindset, right, in terms of learning what we need to do for students right now. We can no longer, we can never, we never could, but we really can't put a square peg in a round hole. And post-pandemic is round hole. So if you're a square peg, you have to be in the game to win it. And so yes, we are consistently, like I mentioned before, the leader in me is the seven habits of, we're really trying to make sure that teachers are up to date with the social emotional learning, with the academic piece. Statistics have shown that the average fallback it slide, if you will, academic slide uh, was um, four to six months. Well, I wanna know where that that research was because it kind of depends on where they were. Like it was yeah. said earlier, students who had uh, greater challenges prior to the pandemic had the biggest challenges post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. With that said, we are really trying very hard to make sure that we spend a considerable amount of time ticking all of those boxes. But like was also mentioned, people are tired. Mm -hmm. We have to keep up. We have to continue to train. We have to continue to learn. We have to continue to be open to it. And there are lots, there's lots more changes to come. They can now mimic your voice, your face. Yes. There are lots of things. So we're trying to teach students and teachers now how to embrace the changes that have come our way so that as those shapes, that square peg and round hole keeps changing, we keep moving along with it so we can continue to progress. I was just to go back to the other conversation about the prep space. I went to graduate school for social work in Chicago in 2010 and I like I did not get taught about restorative practices or the ACE study really in that three-year program in 2010 but I've been doing restorative practices at work before my master's with students in therapeutic day school settings and and then the trauma stuff kind of came later in the workplace and it really wasn't it wasn't embedded in my clinical training at that time and I, I don't know a lot about the prep space because I, I don't work in higher ed, but I do think that that, just to emphasize the on-the-job training, sitting in a circle day after day is how you learn that. It's, mm -hmm. And so I can talk all, all I want to about like a task force to review standards, but like unless people are actually sitting and doing it, they're not really going to be good at it. That's yeah. especially true. I we need like a soda story version for SEL because after soda story, then the science of reading took off. And I mean, there's controversy around it, but it was accessible, widely distributed, very impactful. And now like every state is, do, is pushing science of reading, money is flowing to it. We need that version for the SEL work, like something so that people understand this, this could prevent the next school shooting like this. You know what I mean? Like, so whoever that, like, you know, busy researcher or newspaper, <laughs> like, we need that because it makes people pay attention. It was so, right? Wasn't it effective? It was, it was really effective, and it just shifted, like, almost overnight. Mm -hmm. Everyone's doing science of reading, so.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Erin Manuel. I'm with the North Carolina, um, public, uh, sorry, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. I'm a former principal, former arts teacher, um, and now I'm a baby researcher. I'm getting back into the research space. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, Liz, a little bit about this, the story around, the social story around um, the SDLPs. I know on the political end, there can be a lot of like barriers around just even approaching the, mm -hmm. the, the, the topic, depending on the state politics or what have you. Mm -hmm. So can any of you all further discuss that along with Liz about what, how do you reach that topic around the area when there may be some touchiness around the topic? Mm. Uh, and I'm, I I represent Ohio, that's, that's it. <laughs> but Cleveland, so it's different than the state. <laughs> um, I would say uh, we actually be, we don't necessarily have the touchiness because we are in a major metropolitan city, city um, and or maybe we're kind of operating, you know, behind closed doors, probably doing things that if attention came to my district, it would be, but my district is like the most progressive district in the state of Ohio, so like people don't come for Cleveland Heights, really. Um, so that helps. But I will say that um, the thing that gets challenging is that, and this is why I said we need the research, there's not necessarily a lot of expertise around what that is and what that looks like. I found that um, uh, and then to get to, there's, there's so much like real deeply personal work around social emotional learning and teachers connecting to students. I truly believe teachers want to connect, love kids, show up every day wanting to do the best work. Um, but it gets difficult if you feel like I am getting hammered by, you know, this student who's having a tough day and you're asking me to absorb a whole lot. That is why the training and the research and the understanding is so important. So, you know, you know, there's research that shows that when, when educators dive deep into the research around SEL, they are more empathetic, like when they understand it. And we can't assume that people just know it because they don't, but they do, they, they will know a screaming child that's kicking me that I have to restrain every day and I don't necessarily have time to know the whole, you know what I mean? So, like, Finding space for those pieces, and it takes a lot of time. You talk about what's needed. It does take a lot of time to give educators that space to learn and grow and struggle and argue, and you know what I mean. Like, but you need that, um, and and we can do it. Now, in some places you can't you can't even do that. You have to call it something. You know how people are now calling things other things that they want to talk about. <laughs> you know, you know, you got it. Strategy is strategy, right? Um, so, like, that's been my, my experience, like, finding that time. And then you got to really believe, at the end of the day, like, I really believe that our kids, parents, teachers, principals, board members, they really want the best for kids. And sometimes it, it does get really hard. You just got to stay in it. You know, like, my union president and I, you know, we'll go at it. But, like, at the end of the day, we can kind of come to a conclusion and say, but we got to move forward because we want – she, she and I want great working environment for the teachers. She and I want the kids to do well. We want people to feel joy coming to work. We want kids to have joy. You know what I mean? So I don't think I answered your question, but <laughs> thank you for letting me vent. I'll take just a, a different approach. I'm a former high school math teacher, and when I was teaching math, 60% of adults probably said they can't do math. Mm -hmm. And they're the same people who said, why are you changing how you're teaching math? Teach it like I, I learned it. I'm like, well, I, we're really teaching it. You, you never learned it. That's why we're changing it. Um, but that is the state of public education. You know, the, the sold the story example is a prime example. Sometimes you do things that's, that's not right. And then the public mm -hmm. gets suspect. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the reality is we are one 200-year experiment in how to help our youth learn stuff. And so I had parents say to me once, I don't want your experience of my kid. I'm like, well, hey, everything we're doing this year is an experiment. We're trying it for a while, and we'll try some other stuff. I would say I've had some success with things. You know, we were in the 90s and early 2000s. It was character education. There's a lot of overlap with character education and social emotional learning. If, if we don't use the jargon and we describe the activities, we can get our naysayers on board. We're going to talk to your students about how to help each other get along in class so that everyone can listen to the teacher. And parents are like, yeah, that sounds great. 
Well, that's social emotional learning. Yeah. <laughs> but if we don't, if we don't, yeah. if we just use the jargon, right. then they believe whatever's on social media that the jargon is. Right. So that, I've had some success. It's not seamless because yeah. there's doubters. I would just really echo what what he said from a state perspective and rolling out the SEL, we have had actually the greatest number, like per, uh, what do you call that? Capita. Per capita, thank you, of uptake in far southern Illinois, hmm. Carbondale, near Kentucky. And it is because the regional office that leads the grant has, they're just excellent leaders yeah. in their community. They just really are the people who. At the time that the, the opportunity was rolled out, they took it, they organized it, and they're people that do school improvement work. That's what their job has been before they did this. And they um, have done a lot of in-person work, they've done a lot of relationship buildings, and they do truly just describe the activities. They don't really worry about the titles, mm -hmm. of whether it's called reach to them or something else. They have... They have um, empowered a leader at every school, even though that wasn't actually part of the model that the Children's Hospital rolled out, and it's been extremely successful. If you look at a map of the schools that have taken up the program, Southern Illinois is like dark with bubbles because they just have had so many schools that have wanted to do it. So I, I think that the name of it doesn't matter as much as what it actually is. and. You know that I, I bring that back to the students you asked about students earlier and I was talking about how our student advisory council which is a state uh, state board of education advisory council made up of students from all over the state said you know the SEL standards say nothing in them about digital relationships or like behavior online because they're 20 years old and they they don't really care what they're called but they all know that mm -hmm. they need to be taught about that yeah starting probably in kindergarten. Um, even though kindergartners don't have phones, they're still learning about, well, some, I'm, okay, you're, I have a kindergartner, she doesn't have a phone. But she is certainly watching me use my phone and thinking about how she's gonna use a phone one day when she gets one, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. I, I have so many. Uh, I, I, I love the fact that we're asking teachers and students uh, questions about uh, these kinds of things. And I, I'm, tr I'm trying to resolve in my head whether I can consider that to be best practice. Um, I, I'd love to know on the Chicago slides, was that data from like a, a Five Essentials, that database, or is it a different kind of data collection that you were doing? I, I, the reason I ask is because I want to try to demystify some of this, and I know some of the tools, you know, Panorama has a tool, mm -hmm. a lot of tools out there, and I'm just always curious about what people are using, and, and then it's effective mm -hmm. use, and how prevalent right now is the collection of sort of climate surveys and the, and the high quality usage thereof? Um, I can speak to the surveys that we administered in Illinois. So Illinois statewide, they use the Five Essential Survey. Um, five Essentials doesn't deeply measure educator well-being. And so we created a new instrument to, to cover well-being. It also, it's like readiness to do this work. So there's a bunch of questions on there and school conditions supporting this. Um, so, so that's new. We knew for this study. Um, the student measure was actually developed out of a prior IES-funded research practice partnership um, between the University of Illinois at Chicago and the Washoe County School District. They developed, they refined actually a measure that I had been using um, of student social emotional uh, competence. Um, and they did a lot of focus groups with students, a lot of student interviews to basically develop harder items. And so the instrument that came out of that is the one that um, Chicago was using uh, district wide. And so we, are, we adopted that instrument for student social emotional learning. Can I just say, though, I really appreciate your question because, and, and also just a reflection on not only giving but using it. Because let me just, t like, in the field, right, like, we looked at the price of Panorama, looked interesting, couldn't really afford it. They said we could use a couple of their questions, so we did. So we kind of, like, cobbled together our own survey. And there are probably lots of districts who are 
doing that. Um, I'm not sure if our state has something, they, and they might have something that schools can use too as well, but just kind of like getting that information. Like you'll have people who are like, we know we need to hear from students to feel, see how they feel, right? So what should we, like literally this is how it happens. What should we ask? Oh, let's look at this. And I know, I know the five essential stuff. So I was like, okay, let's look at some of these questions, let's look at some of the parent questions, and, you know. But I, I think people still need help with that. Or if there are things out there, getting that word out so people kind of know like where it is and why it's important, why, why, why it would help me to even take the time to do it. I remember even thinking, can we ask this question? Is this going to make the teachers mad? Because I, I want them to keep coming to work. And I know that, you know what I mean? Like it's, so like all those kind of pieces, figuring out like to how to get practitioners who might not have a big shop, who can just push something out or do the heavy lift of managing the politics to, to, to get, get out, to get, get those pieces out there too as well. So I just want to, I really appreciate that. And again, appreciate the sharing you guys have done. I'm going to be using, by the way, these slides in an upcoming <laughs> meeting on Monday with both my cabinet and then later with the district leadership team in May. So thank you. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just say one thing about Illinois that's also separate from this project, but um, we are planning to look at phasing in universal screening of students, mental health screening, which is not the same as SEL screening. Um, that is part of an initiative of the governor's um, and his the, the really great need to transform children's behavioral health access in Illinois. So like outside the education space, the way that a child would get to a behavioral health you know, point of contact through a state agency has been very, very disorganized and overwhelming. And so there's been a lot of work um, partnering with some folks at Chapin Hall in Illinois to do that. Um, and I, we did a landscape scan mm -hmm. of universal screening activities of all school districts in Illinois last year and wrote a, released a paper about it. So not, not like actually a mandate, not actually, but just a paper to kind of survey what schools are doing. We had um, quite a, a large response rate from districts, so mm -hmm. I'd be happy to share the resource of that paper mm -hmm. if you're interested in reading it. It talks about what tools they use, it talks about barriers. We did yeah. 13 listening sessions, several with students, um, to just really get a sense. Cause, so we are going in that direction as a state, um, but we know that, you know, what what parents think really matters, how it's um, how we support as a state agency um, school districts in offering it is really, really matters. Mm -hmm. So um, happy to talk more about that with anybody mm -hmm. if they want to. That's good. I've heard whispers of universal screening where we are. And so in the conversations that have taken place right now, I know that getting the parents to sign off on that um, we have to figure out how to navigate rolling that out and communicating exactly what that would look like. But we haven't implemented it yet, nor have we, I haven't gotten any more information about that right now. But it is, I know that it's in the works. And we mm -hmm. use a professional learning community right now that I talked about before about triangulating data, but it is those five essential mm -hmm. points, so. One thought, you know, the risk, we were implementing a screener for SEL in elementary schools in my previous job, and I had a board member who was very concerned that we would be doing all these assessments on kids and not telling parents. Mm -hmm. And I had this conversation with them and said, all of our teachers are constantly assessing kids in class and saying, oh, that kid's not right. <laughs> Call the counselor. <laughs> You're at the mercy of whoever is trained or not trained in providing feedback, a universal screener at least gives a common set of, yeah. here's some things to look for. You do run into, well, are we testing kids without parents' knowledge? And we, we, we have to be overt with, we're gonna be do this, doing this survey with your students, here's the kinds of things, give it to parents to look at. But uh, then the last piece I'll just talk to you about asking students and, and best practice, you know, coming back from the pandemic, our teachers wanted some more time for collaboration the year after the pandemic. And so my high school associate superintendent had a great plan to give our high school teachers like every ninth Monday off. And, and they said, well, we should get some buy-in and what better way than to ask our students because who likes time off more than high school students? Mm -hmm. So I did listening sessions at the five conference of high schools and I sat down with them and 95% of them said, absolutely not. I'm not going to miss one more day in school. Mm -hmm. I hated being at home mm -hmm. and it was, it was valuable information that I would have, I mean, I would have guessed mm. based on the emails I got about snow days that, 
they'd never want to come to school again. But that was valuable input for me to say, and we shared it with the board, that students, they said, find another way to do this, mm -hmm. rather than uh, not having them be in school. So sometimes we learn from students things that, that were counterintuitive to what we'd guess. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, please join me in thanking our fabulous <laughs> I really appreciate it.